It's an enormous pleasure to welcome the, uh, to welcome, actually, to welcome you all back to this afternoon session, and I'd like to particularly welcome the WHRF trustees who are joining us for at least part of the afternoon. So welcome to everyone. It's also a great pleasure for me to introduce the John Vain Lecture this afternoon. It's actually amazing and actually rather embarrassing to recall that at one time uh, we considered lipids simply to be a diverse collection of greasy substances that could be extracted from cells and tissues with organic solvents. We thought that they were substances with little physiological importance other than possibly components of membranes and a sort of a convenient energy store. This, this is an attitude which persisted, unfortunately, well into the 1970s, as I can recall from my own PhD viva. But the story of the discovery uh, of that these apparently inert fats were actually, could actually be transformed into an astonishing range of uh, biological mediators uh, was, in fact, as distinctively Swedish as Kurt Wallander, Volvo, Ikea, <laughs> meatballs. <laughs> it was, in fact, a young Swedish medical undergraduate, Ulf von Euler, who first demonstrated that there was a substance in human seminal plasma that depressed the blood pressure of the rabbit. And for various reasons, he named this substance prostaglandin, and thus the whole field uh, was begun. After the war, which interrupted these studies, um, the identity of this lipid was established by Sune Bergstrom, uh, who solved all sorts of difficult pr uh, purification problems using state-of-the-art purification techniques, which in those days included reverse phase chromatography and countercurrent distributions. And also, they, he made use of a, a new device, which was also built by another Swede, Ragnar Reihager. I apologize to the Swedes in the audience if the pronunciation is not quite right, who built the first uh, function, probably the first functioning gas chromatograph uh, mass spectrometer. And it was actually ingenious use of this machine which really characterized a lot of the work uh, which went on subsequently in this field and also at the Karolinska Institute. Now at the Karolinska, uh, Bergstrom's group had noted that there was a very strong resemblance between the prostaglandins, structure of the prostaglandins, and some unsaturated fatty acids. And the Karolinska group uh, hypothesized that arachidonic acid and other kindred fatty acids might actually be biosynthetic precursors. And at this point is really when Bengt came into his own, uh, because together with Sune Bergstrom, they established that this was in fact the case, that arachidonic acid was one of the precursors of prostaglandins, and using very ingenious experiments, using um, oxygen uh, labeled with heavy isotopes, Bengt determined the reaction mechanism, and also more significantly, uh, as it happens, uh, that he, he hypothesized that there was an intermediate in the reaction mechanism uh, which built up uh, during the uh, oxidation of arachidonic acid. And after a, a, a long period of consolidation, I think in a real biochemical tour de force, Bengt and his colleagues isolated this unstable intermediate. Well, in fact, there were two of them. One was called PGG2 and one was called PGH2. And this was an astonishing achievement and really revolutionized the field because armed with these unstable intermediates, uh, a whole series of new compounds were discovered uh, in various tissues, including platelets. I also might also mention that um, Bengt's work at this time also clarified another mystery which uh, John Vane's group was working on, and that was what was this mysterious substance called RCS, rabbit aortic contracting substance? and Bengt established that this was, in fact, th what we now call thromboxane A2. Incidentally, I might mention it was Bengt's generosity in sending some samples of these unstable endoperoxides to our laboratory uh, in uh, the Wellcome uh, Foundation, which enabled us to uh, progress the uh, project, which eventually led to the discovery of what was called prostaglandin X to begin with, but which we now know uh, as prostacyclin. In fact, during the 1970s and 80s, there was a sort of complementary synergism between the work coming out of the Karolinska Institute and the work being done at uh, Wellcome uh, Foundation. And in fact, as a young man, I well remember going to the famous Florence prostaglandin meetings or the Vale, equally famous Vale winter prostaglandin meetings, and Bengt's presentation was always uh, one of the highlights of the event because there was always something interesting, a new pathway, a new compound 
had been uh, isolated, and it was a hugely exciting time for all of us. I could go on, because Bent has made an enormous number of other contributions, including the identification of an, the equally mysterious SRSA. But I'm going to leave that for him to describe. Uh, Bent's seminal con uh, contributions were recognized in 1982, of course, by the award of the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine, uh, jointly with Sune Bergstrom and our own John Vane. And here's a picture of him, I hope, uh, on the steps uh, on that occasion. And uh, I think this, uh, the fact that they're smiling conveys something of the happiness that we all felt uh, that their contributions had been uh, uh, recognized in this way. But I've already said enough, probably too much. So, Bengt, you're very welcome here, and uh, we salute your fine achievements, and it gives me great pleasure to invite you to talk to us about the way in which you've elucidated and unraveled this very complicated arachidonic acid cascade. Thank you, Rod, for your kind invitation. It's certainly a great pleasure for me to be here and celebrate the William Harvey Research Institute anniversary, and um, especially since the uh, Institute is uh, very closely related to John Bay. Uh, Okay, I'll try this one. Uh, John Vane would have been proud of the Institute today. He had very high scientific standards, and this is what the Institute has uh, 30 years after he founded it. Uh, John and I uh, became, over the years, very, very close friends good friends, had many, many dinners together, because we both liked uh, good food and wine. And Lady Vane and I loved to dance together, <laughs> <laughs> many times, and uh, especially at the Nobel banquet in 1982. So, so I, um, the, the, the title of the lecture here is um, The Evolution of the Arachidonic Acid Cascade. And as uh, Rod Flower mentioned, the prostaglandins were uh, discovered by Goldblatt in the US and von Euler in um, Sweden. And uh, here is um, von Euler uh, to the left. And um, he, uh, so he was one of the discoverers of the prostaglandin activity. And he was not a chemist, he was a physiologist, and he actually handed over the problem of chemistry to Sune Bergström, and uh, who started to purify prostaglandins. And uh, one day <coughs> I was, uh, uh, had almost finished my PhD, uh, he had purified prostaglandin E1 and uh, came with a small bottle of a white powder to me and said, would you like to join me in determining the structures? Which I did, and um, uh, here are the structures uh, of uh, the E1 series, E2, E3. And uh, it was actually not until we had the structure of PGE3, where all the double bonds were there in the right place, that we actually got the idea that the polyunsaturated fatty acids could be precursors of the, uh, of the prostaglandins. At that time, when we had shown the conversion of, um, of uh, arachidonic acid into prostaglandins, 
And I'm glad to see Eric Engord in the audience because um, we <coughs> looked at guinea pig blood and the conversion of arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. It was that uh, system that John uh, used to show that aspirin and aspirin-like drugs inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. And that was a very important step, and it provided us with a tool to study the physiology of prostaglandins because we could inhibit the prostaglandins uh, uh, specifically. I became interested, as Rolf mentioned, in the mechanism of the transformation of arachidonic acid into prostaglandin E2 and F12, and uh, using various uh, um, tricks. One was a mixed uh, O8 in O16, where I could show that uh, two oxygens in the uh, in, in the prostaglandins uh, here originated in one molecule of oxygen. And that led to the uh, development of the hypothesis of endoperoxides uh, being precursors. And um, eventually, we also isolated uh, uh, the PGH2 which was an unstable endoperoxide, and showed to our surprise that it was much more active than any of the known prostaglandins, which indicated to us that uh, it was either uh, the endoperoxide or some new products from endoperoxide, um, the intermediate, that had this um, action. Especially interesting was that uh, PTH2 aggregated uh, platelets. And we worked very hard on uh, characterizing arachidonic acid metabolites in uh, platelets. But none of them uh, could aggregate platelets. We had one compound here but uh, it didn't do anything uh, in terms of aggregating platelets. So we did an experiment where we <coughs> took two test tubes with platelets, and in this one we also had a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. And then we measured the amount of endoperoxide and the aggregating activity that was generated from the arachidonic acid that we, we measured. And it turned out that the half-life of the endoperoxide was five minutes, whereas this aggregating activity uh, was 30 seconds. This led us to do trapping experiments where we eventually uh, trapped a very unstable uh, substance, 30 second, half-life of 30 second, and with a very strange structure, an oxane structure. And uh, so we, um, uh, we gave it the name thromboxane because they came from thrombocytes and the salient feature was an oxane uh, structure. I presented that work at a, a meeting in Florence, and um, afterwards, uh, John came up to me and said, can we have some endoperoxides? He was at Burroughs Welcome at that time, and was interested in developing uh, of course, inhibitors of, of thromboxane. And I said, sure, we'll send you some. It was very unstable, so we have to ship it in big boxes of dry ice and so forth. But uh, 
this uh, led to, as uh, Rod also mentioned, uh, to the discovery of prostacycline. And thromboxane A2 and prostacycline have completely different uh, effects. It's platelet aggregating, it's anti aggregating, vasoconstrictor, vasodilator. In addition, this is uh, bronchoconstrictor. And uh, it was um, at that time uh, that um, Carlo Patrono and, uh, and Gerald Fitzgerald uh, discovered that low dose aspirin specifically inhibits the formation of thromboxane A2 and leaves the formation of prostacycline intact. And um, this, of course, led to the, the, the low-dose aspirin usage. And uh, I'm just showing here what's um, happening. This is with no drug, the balance between the two from boxing, prostacycline. With a low-dose aspirin, you inhibit from boxing A2, but not prostacycline, which makes it antithrombotic. And uh, if you uh, give ANSAIDs, you inhibit both. And uh, with the COX inhibitors, uh, you specifically inhibit uh, prostacycline formation without touching. And this is the reason for the um, vascular problems uh, with the COX-2 uh, inhibitors. And this is the effect of the low dose uh, aspirin on vascular uh, mortality in myocardial infarction. Now, <coughs> so now we had um, had a whole tree here, uh, of which we uh, call the cyclooxygenase pathway, uh, with the COX-1 and the COX-2 and the inhibitors and the intermediates and the earlier compounds E2, F2 alpha were known from the beginning. We discovered PGD2, which is important in allergic reactions. And here is a pair of thromboxane and uh, prostacycline. Because of the, uh, of the problems with the COX-2 inhibitors, uh, we started to look for enzymes uh, that were catalyzing the formation of, uh, of uh, PGE2, especially. And it turned out that uh, uh, there is a mapping series or a superfamily of proteins that, um, and there is one, they are used in detoxification especially. And uh, there's one called MGST1, and there's one MGST-like one. And it turned out that we, uh, uh, that this one is uh, converting the endoperoxide into prostaglandin E2. These are my collaborators uh, in this uh, work. So the um, MTSTL1, which we renamed MPGE synthase 1, uh, specifically uh, catalyzes the formation of PGE2 uh, from the endoproxide without touching prostacycline and thromboxane uh, A2. It's actually connected with uh, COX-2. So the endoperoxide that uh, feeds uh, the PGH2 to this enzyme, it comes from uh, COX-2. And um, we looked at um, mouse models and uh, 
deletion of this enzyme has anti-inflammatory effects, no effect on thrombogenesis, and actually retards aterogenesis. And this is um, now being uh, developed by the uh, several drug companies uh, as uh, possible um, in <coughs> uh, anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, at the time of, I mentioned the conference in Florence in 1975, at that time there was a lot of discussion on um, the release of uh, arachidonic acid. It was considered that steroids inhibit the release of arachidonic acid and um, aspirin, of course, inhibits uh, formation of the endoproxide. And um, I did the very simple uh, reasoning that uh, uh, there is a difference between the effects of steroids and aspirin, and maybe there are other compounds formed from arachidonic acid that could contribute to this uh, difference. And um, with <coughs> a very simple uh, system, we added arachidonic acid to a peritoneal, uh, stimulated peritoneal leukocytes and found a whole group of, of compounds. This is an HPMC chromatura. And they all had a, a conjugated uh, trion system. And, uh, and uh, this work was done in collaboration with Pierre Bourgeois. And we eventually um, determined the structure of one of the products, and it was a 5,12-dihydroxy derivative of arachidonic acid. And uh, we thought it would be interesting to see if, if this are two, if there are two lipoxygenases that are um, catalyzing this formation. And to our surprise, it turned out that this oxygen actually came from molecular oxygen, and this from water. And that, of course, had implications for the mechanism of the formation. And um, we uh, eventually worked out uh, the mechanism, which is initial oxygenation at C5, and then addition of water and rearrangement to form an allylic uh, epoxide in conjugation uh, with this uh, triene. And, um, uh, and this is then hydrolyzed to form the 5,12-dihydroxy acid. We actually had help from the organic chemist E.J. Corey to work out the um, stereochemistry of these uh, products. Now, uh, one morning, we were out and sailing with a family in the Stockholm archipelago. And uh, one morning I woke up and I got the idea, maybe the pathway we have found in the leukocytes could be related to um, slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis. And you know the history of this discovered by Feldberg and Kellaway, and uh, it's formed uh, guinea pig lungs and so forth. And <coughs> uh, you can release it from uh, sensitized <coughs> guinea pig lungs uh, by adding a specific antigen. And um, it was characterized by a group 
in Boston uh, as a liquid ultraviolet uh, absorbance. And um, I was very fortunate. Uh, I had one collaborator, Sven Hammarström, and uh, at the time we were were studying this um, uh, the structure of what we uh, what was um, slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis. I was also joined by Bob Murphy, and he had some experience in um, in SRSA research and uh, with uh, generating uh, SRSA from guinea pig lungs. We thought that was a very cumbersome and decided to use a mast cell cell line and where we immediately could show that labeled arachidonic acid uh, went into SRSA. And so that um, has led to a, actually a very rapid uh, structural work uh, where our intermediate here, uh, the epoxy that was hydrolyzed to, um, to the dihydroxy acid. If you <coughs> add glutathione to this conjugated, uh, it turned out this was a slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis. And again, we worked out the stereochemistry and confirm the structure uh, with uh, EJ uh, core. And this is metabolized to, uh, to uh, look try and D and uh, by gamma glutamine transpeptidase and by dipeptidase to look try and E4. So slow reacting substance is actually a mixture of three uh, uh, Compounds, and uh, we uh, again, we were, before we were going to the conference, we said that we must call it something, and um, and that's uh, where we use the same principle as from boxer, <coughs> came from leukocytes, and the salient feature was a conjugated triad, and therefore became leukotriene. C4, D4, and yeah, E4. And this, um, so here is uh, the five lipoxygenase <coughs> pathway uh, where you form the intermediate, the dihydroxy acid, which we call leukotriene B4. And this is a very powerful in recruiting and uh, stimulating inflammatory cells. And here are the cystinyl leukotrienes, the slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis, uh, causing uh, in, w by interaction with the cis LT1 receptor bronchoconstriction, edema, recruitment of eosinophils, which is essentially the symptoms of um, asthma, and there is another uh, receptor for vascular uh, things. And here you can see the excretion of leukotriene E4, uh, healthy controls, mild asthmatics, a significant um, increase, and in severe asthmatics. And this has um, uh, <coughs> this is uh, Montelukast. Actually, almost a day I presented this in in Washington at a big um, uh, prostaglandin uh, conference, and uh, Merck uh, immediately started to develop um, leukotriene antagonists and. Uh, this is uh, Monte Lucas, uh, also called uh, single air. And you can see the increase in FEV, FEV 
after um, uh, treatment for a couple of uh, weeks. Um, Look at try and B4 is also interesting. It has a number uh, of effects. I mentioned the recruitment of a large number of inflammatory cells, stimulates uh, leukocytosis, and it's also releasing bactericidal peptides. And um, uh, the enzyme you want to uh, uh, to inhibit uh, is of course the hydrolase and um, uh, we looked at the structure determined the, the structure of the leukotriene A for hydrolase and uh, it's a zinc uh, enzyme but to our surprise it has two uh, enzymatic activities, an epoxide hydrolase activity which converts leukotriene A4 to leukotriene B4. But it also converts, uh, has a peptidase activity and both are requiring uh, a zinc um, atom. We have, uh, uh, we were um, wondering very much uh, if, what, if there was a real substrate for the peptidase activity. And uh, when there is an activity, there is usually a reason for it. And it was uh, not until in 2010 that Snellgrove and uh, collaborators um, uh, showed that PGP uh, uh, is an uh, excellent um, uh, uh, substrate. And this is, um, uh, is a neutrophil attractant and a biomarker for uh, COPD. And this is, uh, as I said, degraded by the time A for hydrolase. And um, Cigarette smoke, for example, inhibits uh, the hydrolase, uh, which means that you increase the amount of PGP uh, and you get the accumulation and, and um, uh, attraction of uh, neutrophils. So if we <coughs> look at the LTA for hydrolase, it um, it has uh, epoxide hydrolase as forming leukotriene B4, and you have a peptidase that's uh, degrading uh, the PGP. And uh, the problem when we looked at it um, is, of course, to find selectivity. And here is the X-ray crystallography, and um, with two pockets, one for the for the epoxide hydrolase, and uh, one for the peptidase. And we have now found um, a group of um, inhibitors that specifically uh, inhibit. Uh, inhibit um, the uh, epoxide hydrolase, but is not touching uh, the peptidase activity. Of course, if you inhibit both, then you get PTP activity and uh, attraction of uh, neutrophils. And this is now being uh, being developed. Um, um, especially for treatment of COPD. Charlie Seren has told you everything about lipoxins and uh, all of his other derivatives uh, of, uh, of um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, but um, 
I should at least uh, mention this. Uh, Charlie was a uh, postdoc in our lab, and uh, one day he came and said, I'd like to try to incubate it with uh, uh, the, you know, we had a system going with leukocytes with 15HP ET, and, um, and that led to the um, formation of uh, what we call lipoxin A4 and lipoxin B4. I don't even remember why we call them that, but we couldn't find any better name, I guess. Uh, and um, they, uh, and here is um, uh, leukocytes, platelets, there's uh, uh, transcellular activity forming LXA4, or you can start with 15 LO and, uh, and then in leukocytes and form LXA4. And this is uh, something Charlie found later on that um, aspirin uh, treated uh, patients have, uh, can use COX-2 to generate uh, lipoxin, uh, epi lipoxin A4 and they have the, uh, interaction with uh, FPL1. And um, now I did something I shouldn't. <laughs> Can you do the trick again? Oops. Oh my, well, we'll get that. <laughs> One at a time. There we are. Okay. So, yeah, that's fine. So um, at that time, uh, what um, started with uh, prostaglandins became the arachidonic acid uh, cascade. And uh, with the cyclooxygenase pathway, prostaglandins thromboxane, lipoxygenase pathway, leukotrienes, lipoxin, solvins, eoxins, I'm not going to talk about that. There's not much here. Uh, biology known about that. Now this um, arachidonic acid cascade has over the years generated several drugs. Uh, some were known from the beginning, the NSAIDs and uh, John Vane and others showed the mechanism of action, the low dose aspirin uh, came out of the uh, work and uh, celecox seeps for anagestic even with a restricted use. Iloprost and so forth is uh, used for arterial pulmonary hypertension. This came um, uh, out of um, John's work. Uh, dinoprostol used in obstetrics. Misoprostol has been used uh, to a limited extent for prevention of gastric ulcers in connection with NSAIDs. Alprostadil is used uh, in blue babies with congenital heart defects where you um, uh, want to keep the ductus arteriosus open until you can uh, operate. Latanoprost uh, and so forth are used uh, widely for treatment of glaucoma and Monte Lucas and others are used to treat asthma and rhinitis. And um, very recently another use of Monte Lucas, the Lucatron and D for antagonists was shown to have, this is uh, good news for rats, 
uh, only so far. Uh, but um, it's, uh, <coughs> it has functional and rejuvenating um, activities of uh, age brain uh, by uh, antagonizing uh, one of the LTD4 uh, receptors. And uh, it's, it's very uh, exciting because this is not, uh, you know, genetically modified mice where you can uh, uh, form, um, uh, form uh, Alzheimer-like uh, um, uh, states. But this is in uh, 20, uh, 20 months old. Uh, rats where they <coughs> uh, the uh, memory uh, and uh, cognition functions uh, deteriorate so it um, it uh, restores learning functions and restores memory function and it um, reduces the neural inflammation and um, uh, uh, it actually increases neurogenesis through inhibition of uh, one of the uh, receptors. As I said, it's, um, it's uh, good news for us and uh, we're, we're really very interested in it to see uh, if it uh, holds up in clinical uh, studies as well. And uh, I just end with, uh, in addition to the established drugs I mentioned earlier, here are some potential uh, targets for additional medicines. Uh, I mentioned the MPG synthase inhibitors, inflammation and pain, and the LTA for hydrolase inhibitors, where we can selectively inhibit uh, the formation of leukotriene B4 or in uh, COPD and um, uh, as uh, Charlie told you uh, it's uh, um, certainly a future for lipoxins and the other der similar derivatives and um, want to look at maybe Alzheimer's disease Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I haven't asked Ben whether he'd be stay where you are. I haven't asked Ben whether he'd be prepared to ask to answer questions, but you of course. But if anyone's got a question, um, it looks like you've explained everything, Ben. So. Um, the occasion of this, of course, is the award of our... Oh, I think I didn't see a hand up. Did I see a hand up? Oh, they debate. Oh, yes, okay. Yes, I know. That's okay. Um, of course, the, the occasion here is the award of our John Fain Medal, uh, which is given uh, annually uh, to somebody of Bent's calibre. Uh, and it's an enormous pleasure to ask Daphne Vane to come and present it to Bent. <laughs>